Hey everyone, we're starting our last chapter now, that's statistical thermodynamics. And statistical thermodynamics gives us the link between quantum mechanics and spectroscopy and thermodynamics. And so it's a special place in my heart because um, technically you can derive all of thermodynamics from quantum. And uh, we don't get to it to the very end of the course, but uh, here we go. So uh, we need to start by talking about the Boltzmann distribution. And we've seen the Boltzmann distribution, uh, and we've used it a few times before. So imagine we've got... Uh, an energy diagram here and we're going to set zero to here and we've got some state with an energy E sub I and uh, we want to know the population in that state so uh, if uh, we want to know maybe the number of molecules that are in that state we can use the Boltzmann equation that says the number in the state I is proportional to E to the minus that energy with respect to our zero energy divided by KT and we've met uh, K before, right? So K is our Boltzmann constant, and our Boltzmann constant is just sort of one of those handy constants to keep uh, in your mind. And it's uh, got a value to uh, four significant figures of 1.381 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. And uh, we've seen before that it's equal to the gas constant divided by Avogadro's number. So if we have, instead of one state, we have two states, and we want to know the relative population uh, of uh, state uh, 2 compared to state 1, let's say, uh, we can use the same uh, expression as we have above. We can say that the ratio of the uh, second state to the first state uh, is e to the minus the difference in energy, so that is uh, e2 minus e1 divided by kt. And uh, we'll often use energy instead of per atom, we'll look at it in terms of energy per mole. And so uh, we can always convert these energies um, from a per atom to a per mole basis. So uh, the capital E is going to be our per mole. So that might have units of, say, kilojoules per mole. And our, our lowercase e or our curly e is going to be uh, per atom. And uh, all we have to do is multiply by um, Avogadro's number. So if we've got it per atom, there are n sub a atoms per mole or uh, molecules per mole. So uh, we just multiply by Avogadro's number. So we can rewrite our expression we have above. And uh, instead of uh, n2 over n1 uh, is equal to those individual atomic energies, we can write them in terms of those per molar energies. And so it would be minus e2 minus e1. So we've just multiplied the top by Avogadro's number. If we multiply the bottom by Avogadro's number, we turn the Boltzmann constant into the ideal gas constant. And so this is a very famous equation here. And uh, of course, we could go ahead and say e2 minus e1. That's just delta e. And we've used that before. I think it's kind of helpful to have in your back of your mind sort of a, an idea of what the energy levels look like. And so if we look for uh, translation, so that it's just sort of motion uh, through space, and so we're not in a banded box, uh, we are basically moving through free space. We saw way back when in the fall that the, the energy is not quantized and the energy levels can basically take uh, whatever value they like. So you basically you've got a giant, uh, what we call a continuum of energy levels there. If we put it inside a box, let's say the energy becomes quantized, but uh, in free space basically there's no gap at all between the energies. If we look instead um, of translation, if we look at rotation, uh, what we find is that the energy levels are uh, fairly narrowly separated and uh, we're looking on the order of uh, maybe about 10 to the zero wave numbers and so it's uh, um, sort of, you know, one wave number or 10 wave numbers or maybe in an extreme case, 20 wave numbers might be a typical separation for the rotational energy levels. And as we go to uh, vibrations, what we find is that the spacing is uh, much more widely separated. And so this isn't to scale, uh, but a typical vibrational spacing might be on the order of, you know, 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 3 wave numbers. So if you think of the carbonyl stretch, right, that's about 1700 wave numbers. So 1.7 times 10 to the 3. And uh, that spacing corresponds uh, to that same value as well. And we looked at electronic in the last section, I believe. And in an electronic, uh, you've got massive spacing. So again, this isn't to scale at all. Uh, but you're on the order of, you know, 10,000 to 100,000. So 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 wave numbers here. And uh, this kind of matches our um, you know, our idea of what kind of electromagnetic radiation has to be absorbed. Uh, for uh, rotations, it's uh, microwave. For vibrations, you're looking at infrared. For electronic transitions, you're looking at visible to ultraviolet. So as you get to wider and wider spacings, you need to come in with photons of more and more energy to, to transition between one state and the other. 
Now, if we use the Boltzmann distribution, we can see that the uh, temperature affects the relative population of the states. At absolute zero, there's a zero probability of being in any state other than the ground state. And as we increase the temperature, uh, the probability of accessing a higher energy state uh, starts to increase. Of course, the higher energy the state is, the lower the probability. But as we increase the temperature, the probability of reaching those upper states becomes higher and higher. And of course, the total probability has to be one. So the area under this curve is actually the same. And at infinite temperature, essentially, you can access all the energy states with equal probability. So uh, absolute zero, everything's basically slammed down in that bottom state there. And at infinite temperature, if that exists, then every state is equally probably distributed. So earlier we wrote this equation here, and we said that the number of molecules in a state I is proportional to e to the minus that energy over kT. But we can sharpen this definition up a little bit, actually, and we can say that the number in state I is actually equal to the total number times by the probability of being in that state i. And so the question is, what is the probability of being in that state i? Uh, well, we know it's proportional to e to the minus uh, the energy over kT. Uh, but what we have to do is divide that by the sum of all the proportionalities. And so we can sum all those Boltzmann probabilities over all those different states. And uh, that'll give us the sort of the total probability, uh, at least the total proportional probability of being anywhere. And if we divide that into the probability of being in each state, that ratio will give us the true probability. And so uh, this is a sharper definition, I think, of the more general expression above. Now this term on the bottom here, this sum of all the uh, proportional probabilities uh, is actually given the symbol Q normally, and we call this the uh, partition function. And it turns out the partition function, uh, although here it just seems sort of looks like it's a normalization function. We're just summing up all the proportional probabilities uh, in order to ratio it to find the actual probability. But it turns out it actually plays a really large role in thermodynamics. If we can calculate the partition function, and uh, all we need to do to calculate a partition function is know the energy of the states, which we get from either quantum mechanics or from spectroscopy. But it turns out that everything in thermodynamics from the equilibrium constant to the entropy to uh, the internal energy to the enthalpy, you can actually get out of and extract from the partition function. So in many ways, this behaves as the wave function in quantum mechanics. The wave function is the thing that contains all the dynamic information about the system. And it turns out this partition function is going to play a huge role in thermodynamics. And uh, every thermodynamic property is going to be contained in this, in this simple sum of probabilities. So if we're going to give it the symbol Q, we can rewrite this expression as follows. And at the bottom of the screen in blue is the more familiar form. So the number of molecules in state I um, is equal to the total number of molecules, if you like, divided by the partition function, multiplied by this Boltzmann probability factor here, this e to the minus energy over kT. So our definition of the partition function involves a sum over all the states. But sometimes it's more convenient instead of summing over states to sum over the levels. So for instance, uh, a level is a series of states with exactly the same energy. And so we could say the degeneracy, which we typically use the symbol G to represent. So we've got a threefold degenerate or triply degenerate level here. So uh, we have to be a little more cautious here when we're dealing with levels um, to avoid that we don't undercount. And so the way we're going to do this is basically we're going to say the partition function now over levels. Uh, so I'm going to run my sum there over L for levels. Okay, is equal to the degeneracy of the level times by e to the minus the energy of the level over kT. And so if we've got a triply degenerate uh, system here, right, or a triply degenerate level here, in the original partition function equation, right, we would make the sum over each one of these in term. Uh, but under the level situation, right, we just sum the entire level's energy and we triple it to account for the fact that normally we'd be summing it up three times, let's say. And so if we wanted to know the number of molecules in a particular level, um, that would be equal to the total number of molecules times by the probability of being in that particular level. Um, so that must be the degeneracy of the level times by e to the minus the energy of the level over kT. And uh, we have to divide all of that by the partition function. So that would be our expression here for the number in each level. 
So we could use these ideas to calculate the relative population of the J equals 3 to the J equals 1 level for deuterium chloride here. And uh, we're going to do this at a temperature. We're going to go ahead and just pick our favorite temperature, 298 Kelvin, which is a, a little warm room, I suppose. We know the degeneracy for rotational levels is 2J plus 1. And uh, we need to know the uh, rotational constant. So uh, B, our B tilde is uh, something like 5.45 wave numbers. Uh, for this substance here and uh, we can go ahead now we can calculate that ratio we can calculate the ratio of n3 to n1 where these are the levels instead of the states and it's equal to uh, let me see the total uh, number times by the degeneracy of the third level um, times by e to the minus the energy of that third level over kt all divided by q and we've got the same thing for N1 as well. So we've got the total number times by the degeneracy of that first level times by the energy of that level all divided by the partition function. And here actually the partition function, uh, whatever it is on the top, it's the exact same thing on the bottom. And we can also see the number here is exactly the number of molecules we have in total. It's not gonna affect the ratio. And so all we need to do then is just to calculate uh, G3 times E to the minus E3 over KT and divided by the same expression for the first level. So we know that the energy um, for the levels is given by the expression here, B times by J times by J plus one. And this will be the energy in wave number units. And if you remember, you know, energy is HC over lambda. Uh, so that is HC wave numbers. So if you want uh, to know the energy in units of joules, then you basically just take HC and multiply by your energy in wave numbers. So we can go ahead now and we can uh, write this expression. Just kind of push everything up for a little bit. That's better. Got a little bit more room here. And now we can go ahead and we can calculate that ratio. So N3 to N1 is equal to G3. So that is uh, 2J plus 1. So that is uh, 7 uh, times by E to the minus that energy. So that is HC uh, times by B tilde times by J, J plus 1. So that's 3 times by 3 plus 1. That's 4. And that's going to be divided by uh, the degeneracy of the first level. So 2j plus 1 is 3 times by e to the minus um, hcb tilde times by j and j plus 1. So it's going to look something like this. So 7 thirds uh, times by e to the minus hcb tilde. Um, and then on the top it's going to be, what, 12 uh, divided by, well actually we can make some use here, right, of uh, the properties of exponents and so we can say well the bottom right is 2 so we can basically just subtract that away there and 12 minus 2 is 10 and so we can go ahead and we can calculate this and uh, I think I get something like uh, 7 thirds times by e to the minus 0 0.263 so that is uh, 7 thirds actually e to the minus 2 point or 0 0.263 I get to be 0 0.7687 and when we multiply that together we get 1.79 so basically we're saying that the ratio then there's a uh, 79 percent more molecules in j equals 3 than j equals 1 for the uh, rigid rotor here for deuterium chloride and you might say well that's sort of counterintuitive isn't it so if they're higher energy shouldn't there be fewer of them and uh, it turns out, yeah, the Boltzmann probability per state is actually 0.77. So there is only 77% of them in each state at a higher energy state than a lower. But the degeneracies are coming into play here. There's 7 to 3 ratio here of the degeneracies. And so although the, the higher energy ones have less population in per state, there's more of them. So they get to soak up more of the energy. And that results in a total uh, ratio of something on the order of 1.8.